Okay, good morning to our audience. Good morning to our presenters. Welcome to the 2021 Slave Dwelling Conference. We are so excited that you all have taken the time to join us this morning. I sat in on an earlier session and it was absolutely riveting and I'm sure you're going to find this session to be very informative and riveting. Riveting, I'm so sorry. Um, a few housekeeping rules, please mute yourselves. You're welcome to have your video on, I do believe, but we do ask that you mute if mute. And also during the presentation, if you have questions, please drop them into the chat. There will be time left at the end of the session for the panelists to answer your questions. So without further ado, I am going to turn the session over to our lead presenter, Ms. Anthea Hartick. It's all you from now on. Wonderful. And thank you so much. Um, I hope everyone can see Hi. and hear me. Great. It's a little hard for the presenters to know who's there, but I, I see my incredible colleagues. And, um, and, and thank you so much for joining. Um, uh, I am Anthea Hartig. I have the deep honor of serving as the first woman director of the National Museum of American History at your Smithsonian Institution. And it's truly a, a pleasure and an honor to be here, especially uh, with my brother in arms, uh, Joe McGill, and all that you've done throughout the years that we've known each other to bring attention to the complicated, layered, horrible, beautiful messiness that is our cultural landscape, and that is the legacy of slavery, and to bring us all together in community today. I am joined by three amazing colleagues whom I'll introduce uh, in a minute from the National Museum of American History, and together we'll explore ways in which we're trying to challenge the narrative landscape of the past in order to fulfill our new mission of creating more just and compassionate future. I'm honored to first recognize that I'm here in the museum um, on the ancestral lands that were shared by the broader Algonquin peoples, in particular the Piscataway, the Pamunkey, the Nakachtank, their descendants and so many native peoples still live and work here in the District of Columbia. And we're deeply grateful and want to acknowledge and give our respects and gratitude um, to them and to their ancestors for the opportunity to work in this territory. Um, my colleagues joining me today represent a, a wonderful intersection of our work uh, as it evolves. Um, I'm first joined by uh, Patti Artiaga, who is the program coordinator for the National for Our Museum's new Center for Restorative History, about which you'll be hearing more. She works in the intersections of restorative justice and museum practices, and this new center explores how working with community at the museum can co-address needs, harms, obligations, and to understand historical root causes for current injustices. Patty was the former project lead and co-creator of the Undocumented Immigrant Organizing Collective Initiative here at the museum, and she'll share a bit more about that with you today. She was born and raised in Los Angeles, um, graduated from UCLA, go Bruins, uh, but then came east to receive her master's at George Washington University. Um, Dr. Modupe Labode is a curator here uh, in two divisions, both the Division of Political and Military History and Culture and Community Life. Modupe's area of concentration is African-American social justice history. She earned her bachelor's degree at Iowa State and her doctorate at Oxford. Madupe is well known in many fields. She was a public scholar of African American museums and history and associate professor of museum studies, public history and Africa, Africana studies at IUPUI in Indiana. Her research continues to focus on how the lived experiences and interpretations of race have changed over time and place and how history is understood in our lives. Dr. Orlando Serrano, Jr. Uh, is our manager of our youth and teacher programs here at the museum. Orlando manages all of our education programs for young people and their educators. He has supported and developed numerous informal education and leadership experiences for students and professional development workshops for educators. He specializes too in curriculum content and is an experienced educator himself 
um, as a former high school teacher and thinks broadly about teacher professional development, assessment, instruction, and educational technologies. His PhD is from the University of Southern California, where he specialized in American studies and ethnicity and political and human geography. It's wonderful to be with the three of them today. We're going to turn to uh, our PowerPoint, which I think Madupe is going to drive the car. And thanks again to Laverta James and everyone to help us get us to this point. So. How are we doing, Madupe? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, I realized it is, um, it is, I can't see you when I, when it's up. So I'll oh, just okay. say it's up. Okay. I'm so going to mute okay. myself. It, yeah, this one doesn't look like the right one, though. This is just part of it. No. Our apologies. We thought we had this all worked out. I'm going to drop it in the chat, my dupe. Maybe I can. Maybe I can run it. No, there we go. Well, that first slide is right, <laughs> and there we all are. Okay. Um, we are incredibly fortunate to be at a time in which Secretary of the Smithsonian is Lonnie G. Bunch III. Lonnie is the first African-American, the first historian, and the first former museum director to lead the museum. This was his statement, the last sentence of his statement that he placed on behalf of the Smithsonian in the New York Times 1619 project. And it is truly one of our guide stars in thinking about the ways in which history can be transformative both in our own lives and across the nation and in the national spaces in which we occupy here. I have the next slide. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Did you hear the part about Lonnie? Wonderful. Uh, I just got this message, the host had muted me, which maybe I've already talked too much. Um, as you might imagine, the first museum strategic plan was drawn up in the 1950s for this brand new museum that opened in 1964. These are a couple of uh, photographs from opening day. You can al already see that the new Museum of History and Technology was already taking an unsurprisingly kind of paleographic um, interpretation of the American past, uh, as well as an interesting and very complicated understanding of science and, and technology. We, however, have created a new strategic plan together after I arrived in 2019 with the incredible cooperation and see our new mission statement empowering people to create a more just and compassionate future by exploring, preserving, and sharing the complexity of our past, and a vision statement that grounds us in accessibility, inclusivity, relevancy, and sustainability. It challenges us deeply to create programs and public history content that meets the demographies of our nation in the next 10 years in terms of audience and who we reach and how we reach them. It is centered on these core four values that again, we arrived at together as participants in the creation of the strategic plan. We think of these and try and live these daily um, in our public history practice. The plan called out for three subsequent plans, collections plan, interpretive plan, and a decolonization plan. I show this slide, of course, of um, the 
Little Rock Nine um, and the integration of, of Central High School uh, in Arkansas as uh, Minnie Jean Brown and others continue to inspire us and her story is woven uh, currently into the museum in our Girlhood is Complicated exhibition. I'm gonna to touch on the three plans and then I'm gonna turn it over to Patti. Uh, and here is Minnie Jean Brown's graduation dress that she designed and hand uh, made. Um, that is one of the features in our education section. And we think about the ways in which these intersections um, work out in our spaces and in our collecting. We've also been incredibly fortunate to work with Minnie Jean um, as part of our youth summit and our youth educational series that Orlando will touch on briefly. So quickly, the first collection, the first plan, the collections plan that we develop is centered in those values. If I could have the next slide. To really understand what the power of our collections are, where that power lies, who's created that power, how is that shared? Um, and then really, how are they brought into utility? Understanding this and the consistency that we are building our collection and rebuilding it at the moment is something that Madupe will touch upon. And I'm grateful to everyone on staff who's taken up the clarion call to kind of come together as the coalition of the willing, as I like to say, um, around this um, really powerful kind of reassessment of our collections. What did this mean during COVID? Um, we can, I'm happy to talk more about this, but forming kind of a rapid response collecting posture as the pandemic hit and as, of course, the, the ongoing and cascading crises, especially racial, constitutional, um, environmental, and um, as well as uh, civic, um, roiled throughout the nation. And that meant, of course, especially after um, the murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and sadly so many others also really trying to center anti-Black violence across time in our new collecting um, around a political um, history, but as well thinking about the many, many ways in which the discrepancies of history have played out in COVID response and of course in human loss, economic loss, um, psychic loss, um, and so much loss and grieving that of course is still ongoing as we crest 690,000 fellow Americans who have died. The interpretive plan also builds upon our strategic goals, values, uh, and vision for the new museum in an old, old complicated space and landscape. Um, in our interpretive work, um, we really try to get to these crossroads, to these intersections, uh, and understand where ca cultures have come together, where they've resisted, where they've revolted, um, what we've learned, um, what uh, we fail to learn over and over again, um, and inspired by so many, but um, thinking about how people come uh, together to make change. And I'm always reminded here of John Lewis's amazing um, statement um, shortly before he died when he was overlooking Black Lives Matter Plaza here in Washington. And he said that we don't know the moment when history is going to change, which inspired him every day in his activism. So the interpretive plan as well seeks out these complexities, tries to understand how they're, they're kind of knotted together, um, and then tries to un, kind of unknot them, unpack them, if you will, to understand the structures and the strictures of power, of conflict, um, and to arrive at um, the, an understanding of agency and power throughout time, and how that plays out to, again, empower people to create that more just future. This is actually a photograph we collected uh, in, in 2020. Um, as we all know on, uh, in this conference, uh, Loving America is very complicated. Um, the last uh, say, thing, few things I'll say on the interpretive plan are really this kind of human-centric uh, approach, understanding these influences across time and place and ethnicity and race and class and sexuality and ability and background and belief, and to really create um, a resonant set of interpretive um, offerings that, build, of course, build on our scholarship and our research and our collection, but are of utility in, in the broader world. 
One example of that kind of relevance and that echoing or that kind of origami of the past, as I like to think about it, is taking Minnie Jean Brown suspension notice uh, here on your left hand side of the screen. Um, of course, she was the minute she started to try and defend herself against uh, the daily um, kind of uh, discriminatory and torturous um, behaviors of her white um, classmates at Central High. She was suspended and then expelled. And we use that, of course, to show this again is from our girlhood. It's complicated exhibition to show that the ongoing discrimination, especially um, black and brown girls who are six times on average more likely to be uh, suspended from school, all at levels of school than their white girl counterparts. The hopes that we had um, to create a true decolonization plan have grown and were challenged and have beautifully uh, come into another being, if you will, um, in the form of the Emergent Center for Restorative History. This practice developed by many, including those on the call with me or on the uh, session with me, um, uh, spearheaded by Sion Wilde Michael and Dr. Nancy Burka here and builds on the work of so many throughout time who have taken a deeply um, community-centered understanding of how to do their work. Okay, I have the next slide. I think I just have a couple more. So decolonizing the museum, which of course is still a very active conversation. The decolonization working group of the strategic plan continues to meet, um, continues to read, continues to think, and continues to inform our, our work. Um, as, uh, as my colleagues know, but it, the, the new Center for Restorative History and this practice, which we'll go into a bit more with you, really tries to look at the carefully at the root causes of the legacies of injustice, working with and amplifying community voices and practice, reassessing our collection, and really deeply believes in co-curation model, as well as critical conversations and developing new approaches to scholarship. You'll see some of this play out in um, when I turn it over uh, to uh, Tapati, um, but the way in which we want to work and develop best practices for that type of deep community engagement and co-curation um, flows from these four um, kind of floor key, uh, four key uh, and kind of inflection points of learning, collaborating, collecting, and then really building capacity. As you can see, the relationships, the collaboration, um, the, the oral history projects, uh, all of this kind of weaving together uh, into um, a form of public history practice that we think uh, will help really transform our work as well as help us fulfill our new mission and our new vision. Great. I'm going to turn it over. Um, uh, to Patty, I think I hear your slides are next. All right, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So uh, thank you, uh, Anthea, for uh, introducing me. And um, as she mentioned, I am the project coordinator for the Center for Restorative History. Uh, and you did such an uh, amazing job of breaking down our kind of method, emerging methodologies, uh, which this project was uh, a great influence to those methodologies. Um, so now I'm going to put on my different uh, cap, right, of my previous role as a project lead for the Undocumented Organizing Collecting Initiative. Um, and so if I can have the first slide, Madupe, would you mind me to? Not sure if I have to share my screen. So. Okay, I want to share my screen. Bear with me.
All right, Anthea, would you mind sharing? It's uh, my browser just not letting me share my screen for some reason. Apologies while we work this uh, technology out. I'm still seeing myself. I'm still unable to share my screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anthea. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention uh, to for the next slide whenever, whenever we have to go. But uh, yeah, so we are, I'm here representing the Undocumented Organizing Collecting Initiative, which is a six site project uh, chronicling the past 20 years of people without citizenship, coming out of the shadows, uh, mobilizing and influencing legislation and becoming their own political force in the 21st century. And there are some photos shared about uh, butterfly monarch wings, and maybe you have heard in the news about dreamers and DACA recipients. And usually that's what undocumented organizers are referred to, uh, the dream dreamers uh, coming from the DREAM Act, which is a, a legislation uh, that would, if passed, um, would provide a pathway towards citizenship for undocumented youth. And then DACA, which is, have been re recently always in the news uh, for its limbo state is a deferred action for childhood arrivals, which is just a temporary status um, and uh, protections from deportation as well as an opportunity for an employment authorization card. Uh, and this is not a pathway towards citizenship. Those, th those two words, so those two acronyms are used interchangeably, but we, um, for this project, we use undocumented organizers to encompass more people that may not have DACA or may not fall under uh, kind of the dreamer narrative. So, um, we, apologies, next slide, please. And so that's how the uh, documented organizing uh, collecting initiative began. In our research, we were recognizing that we are living in a very pivotal point, right? That this movement was um, really focusing on citizenship and that there was a group of young people forcing the government's hand to fight for that citizenship. It happened during emancipation, women's suffrage, and also during civil rights. Now we were witnessing another singular moment and movement such as this one in our history where the very nature of citizenship is being challenged, questioned, and at times completely rejected. And so this is how our origin started, right? We, we noticed that in our research of this movement that there was uh, a very pivotal point that about uh, the story of the self, right? It was the coming out, the, publicly, the public declaration of your status as well, um, as well as that involving that risk of deportation. This was a very different time about 10 years ago when this was very happening. But this is a crucial point in understanding this movement because it was about challenging those harmful and rejecting the very limited narratives that existed about the undocumented community um, back then and, and still unfortunately persist today. Um, there's this binary of good and bad immigrants and they were putting themselves out there, um, rejecting these narratives that existed uh, 
and interweaving their own stories with historical analysis. You know, why they were for, why they arrived to the United States, at what, how legislation affects their bodies and their communities, how they were able to move or their lack of movement. Uh, and so this public declaration of telling their own story via themselves to elected officials, to law enforcement. Um, again, at the very risk of deportation, we, we wanted to center that, um, the very ethos of that movement. And we wanted to also borrow that ethos for our own project and to really center community knowledges, right? For an honest account of this history. Um, this is a very unique time where we don't have to wait five, uh, 10 years or 20 for that to understand that this is a very crucial matter um, and that we have an opportunity to record now with those people who are making that history. Um, but that's of course easier said than done because we face a great challenge of distress and as Anthea mentioned of, of harms, right? Of harms committed um, against, this, uh, against this community and um, next slide, please, um, because for starters, undocumented organizers had trouble trusting us when we set out our first um, outreach calls, right, in our in our uh, first sites, uh, because we are a quasi-federal institution. And you sort of place where you hear federal images of um, ICE, of Department of Homeland Security, of Border Patrol, um, come up, right? These are violent, these are images of violence and hurt. Um, and we don't have to look far uh, into our news headlines within the last weeks to see those images uh, or to see those in our archival records, right? Of, uh, you know, 20 or 100 years ago. Um, so they're very much a persistent image that continues to this day. Um, and likewise, we also are the Smithsonian. Um, they don't see themselves history as representative, or at least just molded into just a, a large um, 11 million pop, uh, population, but there's no agency exerted. There's no personal stories. And there's a good reason for that, right? There, um, for the most part, it's been about anonymity and it's about being behind the so-called shadow. But um, with their breaking through of this movement of the, the public declaration of not being, um, of not hiding and um, you know, proclaiming undocumented and unafraid, they just didn't see that in their own histories, these other systems of oppression that were within their own histories. They didn't see that it reflected in um, any of our museums. So these were the challenges that we first faced in um, really acknowledging this distrust, distrust that they had with us. So for that reason, our practices really um, at the core of it, we're about building that trust, right? We needed, we knew that our practices of oral history and object collecting needed to be absolutely different um, and mostly different in the factor of that we needed to listen, we needed to learn and do that constant reflecting, right? Um, we're in the benefit that we're a collecting initiative and not an exhibit. So the collecting initiative is has more freedom uh, in my sense to, work alongside with uh, our collaborators, right? Because they're, they're molding it as, as long as, uh, along with us. Um, and so some of our oral history practices, next slide, please. Um, before COVID, we would actually visit, um, you know, within our sex, we would go uh, visit, break bread, and we would try to emulate or try um, very much to share more about ourselves, right? We would not talk really much about the project. We would share food. Um, we would not take notes. This is really incredibly crucial. We would not take notes because it needed to reflect more of a conversation rather than a research subject or, um, you know, the, the power imbalances are so visually evident when one is taking notes and one is talking. Um, so we needed to do away with that and really just come away with what are the main messages that they want um, us to reflect within the documenting of this uh, movement. And so really we were listening, we were constantly in conversation with each other. And the main, um, the, the, I think the most beautiful part of our then um, after gaining that trust, that co-collaboration that was able to happen was uh, the, the most evident too, for, at least for me and the most powerful, was that our oral histories, there's no question template. There's uh, no 
you know, use the same questions for every single organizer. It's we're really coming together and by the themes that we were listening, by what they wanted to share with us, then we're molding them together of what um, they would actually like to record. So we're meeting with them three, six months, way before we even are thinking about recording. Um, because we really wanted to do away with the feeling of extraction. So with them participating and how to steer the conversation very much um, allowed them to feel ownership of that, right? Um, and some of the, some of the like beautiful conversations that were able to be recorded in our OR histories greatly expanded our notions of what this movement is all about. You know, uh, some conversations led to uh, going beyond the DACA and Dreamer narratives. Again, this binary of good and bad, just to do perfectly away with that, that they was not serving them. Other parts that to amplify local grassroots organizations or organizing where campaigns can focus on wide variety, uh, wide variety of issues. Again, not just about citizenship, but how are undocumented people working um, for housing? How are they seeking health care? Um, how are they uh, also marching for reproductive rights, right? Um, how are they stopping uh, deportation pipelines or you know, fighting against uh, sheriffs in, in local uh, in the local campaign? So these, um, and, and one more item also, it's to expand the narratives that this is just the brown Latinx issue. Um, we have spoken to queer, black, API, undocumented organizers who vary in experiences what we see in, in uh, media narratives, but greatly pushed us to think more broadly that um, this immigration status affects 11 million and not everyone looks the same and not everyone has the same story nor political ideologies, but that they um, also are you know, also need to tell their story on a national platform such as ours. Um, and lastly, in our oral history um, practices, there's also uh, our recording, our relationship doesn't stop after we record, right? There's also a process of review, review of the transcript as well as the opportunity to um, do some redactions. And those redactions or the reveal, reveal mostly relay on um, legal risk are, are we putting them in legal risk and that's another reason why we chose for only to do oral histories with undocumented organizers because they are publicly out already we're not um seeking to put anyone in danger or have anyone reveal their status um, when they don't want to and so anyone uh, mentioning a statement either about their birthday or some identifiers that can put themselves or their loved ones there are they are that option to um, redact that um, because we, it's not only just about the relationship building, but really wanting to um, make sure that our collaborators are safe um, because once it's released to the public, you know, it's out to the public. That is what um, the, the beauty of public history, but we also need to recognize that we don't want to perpetuate any harms um, beyond, uh, beyond what, what we can recognize at the moment. And lastly, um, all of this needs to happen before they decide whether to donate it or not. Um, you know, there, there's also the opportunity of whether they want to keep it um, exist. Um, no one has. No one ever once sees that the, 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 the putting it to the Smithsonian would be of a, a benefit um, to spreading their, their histories. But um, there's, that's also, again, another part of the relationship building is that they can keep it and there will be no repercussions for it because again, again it is their history. Um, and next slide, thank you. Um, those same practices with oral history are emulated again with object collecting. But one thing I really want to emphasize here is that, um, you know, we, we work with them of what, what do you, what do you think is missing? This is what we have in our uh, collection. What are the stories that you would want, you know, people in 50 years to know? Um, but one very crucial part is that their um, the invitation for their own interpretation along with the object that they donate is more than welcomed. And I would actually say encourage. So anytime the record is pulled up or that object is in use, um, their words are associated with that object. 
um, so that you cannot disassociate the, the material item with the person, as, as Anthea mentioned earlier, right? It begins, history begins with people. And this is just another manifestation of that. Next slide, please. Um, and so I, I mentioned all of these practices uh, because this all takes time. And one of our obligations for our, one of the needs, I apologize, for our um, organizers or for our collaborators was that these stories need to get out there ASAP. Um, especially in the last given years, there's, there's been detrimental narratives out there. And so like, we just need to get these stories out there in a national way. Um, so last February, we created a program called Tell Me What Democracy Looks Like, where we invited five undocumented organizers to record a short video about the most pressing issues that are facing their community. And we have here uh, Zhang Wu talking about mutual aid. Uh, next slide. Another issue to go again beyond citizenship, that there is a merit-based system where um, you know, for some they're they're deemed good and others bad, but really, who do, who uh, gets to decide that, right? And Esther Jaon was able to talk about that. Next slide. Um, Might I was able to talk on the criminalization of immigrants, right? These two systems of um, criminality and now immigration being intertwined and embedded, and how that was creating a deportation uh, pipeline out in Charlotte, North Carolina. And then the uh, next slide, the hyper surveillance state that Moises Serrano was facing in a post 9-11 world, right? That this is where the origins of Department of Homeland Security came. Um, he saw his um, dreams sort of slipping by with these uh, more crucial and just these eyes on him, right? Again, the hyper surveillance that he, he saw or he um, experienced on his body. And lastly, the intersections at play with Dene of um, Black female or Black woman issues, next slide please, <laughs> of Black issues and immigrant issues, sometimes in conversations and sometimes out, out, out of their conversations. So she, in her work to bring those two um, communities together and see how her own experiences were greatly intertwined, right? Being a black woman as well as being an undocumented uh, person. And so these, these slides also accompanied um, a, a Smithsonian learning lab where we placed objects from our collection with historical lineages, historical objects. So here we have um, a, a personal memoir experience of the Japanese prison camp, right? Um, otherizing, otherizing people and literally placing them somewhere else outside of the public view. And then we have Moises Serrano's ID. He's a DACA recipient um, with the red lettering of legal presence, no lawful status, right? The, this red lettering marking him out um, as an other. And these two situations of um, limiting movement and otherizing them. So that there was that lineage that we were able to do within the learning labs. And lastly, we were able to uh, do a live program where we brought three other um, undocumented scholars and, and organizers to discuss what we were doing with the project and, and also see the, the, the historical politics, right? What were we missing? What, how was this all connected to our own? Um, why was there such a disconnect with this history with the larger uh, American history? Um, so I, I will wrap up here with that. These are our processes and practices that we were able to bring voices um, to the to the leading charge of, of shifting these narratives within their community. And you know, we we've been able to do this um, and bring this to um, our museums, our museum audiences' fingertips. Um, and we're so very grateful that we can share these stories out there. And so, thank you. Thank you, Kati, for that. I so appreciate uh, you and all of the team's work. Um, I think with technical difficulties, we may want to just go um, uh, go move forward. But um, Orlando or Madupe, anything that you wanted to add or reflect quickly on on the the projects, the processes, the um, the uh, the work that um, that that Patty shared with us.
really innovative and um, that I've learned some, I personally, like they've been, uh, the undocumented group has been extraordinarily generous sharing their knowledge within the museum and um, their, and really kind of thinking uh, very proactively and protectively toward the people who are sharing with us. Yeah, absolutely. We've all learned so much together. And as well as I think the broader Smithsonian uh, has as well uh, from this work. So, great. In fact, Madupe, why don't um, we just move to you? And um, it would be wonderful uh, for our friends who are helping us with the tech side, if maybe we could see both the presentation and the presenter, if that's possible. I'm running the slides. OK, all right. Well, okay. um, Anthea, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I think everyone really, I, I appreciate your goodwill because it has been every uh, new platform is somewhat different. Mm -hmm. So I am a curator, I've been a curator at the National Museum of American History since 2019, August 2019. So of course, most of my time has been um, like COVID, which might, seems like it's been going on forever. And I've really admired the work of the Slave Dwelling process, Project and I am really, this is really um, amazing to be able to share some of my experiences with you. So I'd like to offer a curatorial perspective, which is mainly focused on the research and interpretation um, that is driving a newer vision of the museum that is one that is really focused on share, um, challenging the narrative um, the chain, try, trying to figure out how we challenge the narrative, even based on the object level. So um, if my, if you can bring up a slide, that'd be great. And if you can't, just let me know. <laughs> oh, it's, so, up. it's up on my screen. Okay, I can't see it. So um, are we, could we go to, are we on? Um, we're, on we're on Nanny. Nanny Helen, okay, Nanny Ms. Helen Burrows. Burrows. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, so Nanny Helen Bur um, wanted to give you a little bit of a focus on how we're looking at, um, how I'm trying to figure out with my colleagues about looking at the object level. So I'm in the division of political history and a, fellow, a curator before me, Edith Mayo, collected the Nanny Helen Burroughs collection. Some of you here are probably very well aware of who she is. Um, she was born in Virginia in 1879, so just after Reconstruction ended. She, she and her family moved to Washington, D.C., and she was a leader in the National Baptist Convention. She was also a, one of the a, a prime proponent of education, like with her friend um, Mary McLeod Bethune and Mary Church Terrell. So uh, Edith Mayo is that collected this in the 19, late 1970s. And that pink card shows the pre-digitization way in which the museum um, collect, documented its objects. And one of the tasks I see before me is thinking, is actually trying to account for how the museum collected African-American objects, which objects center Black people, as opposed to other people working on behalf of Black people, and how we can bring that, make, share those objects with a broader public, particularly through the Smithsonian Learning Labs and other electronic ways in addition to exhibitions. So with Nanny Helen Burroughs, I'm in the, very slowly because of COVID, in the process of looking at what we have from her and also what it can tell us, um, not only about her as a religious figure, but her as an advocate for women wage earners. Um, her, her life as an advocate for somebody who was, who believed that African-American women and girls should get paid equally but also recognize the extreme vulnerability that black women were in when they worked in, uh, particularly in domestic service, but also in offices. Um, these are, so I'm also in the process of learning from many of the other, to many of my colleagues, both in the museum, but especially people who might belong to, might identify as black Baptists, people who identify um, as DC residents, um, for those who are interested in seeing how can we tell a fuller story of her 
and how can we expand that story, the, where people learn about those stories. Next slide, please. So in addition to um, the looking at existing collections, um, I'm also involved on a, in some of the collecting that is responsive to current events. And as, uh, as Dr. Hartig mentioned earlier, that the museum, the National Museum of American History in collaboration with the Anacostia Community Museum and the National Museum of African American History and Culture documented some of the protest against anti-police violence, anti-racism protest and mourning of George Floyd that occurred in um, June, 2020 at Lafayette Square. This, we're very aware that we're built, we're standing on the shoulders of previous curators who had documented uh, protest in our nation's capital, particularly on the mall. But there's a particular responsibility with these protests in 2020 because these were the largest protest movement in US history. And also we were aware that there were new messages that were coming up that you can see here. First is you see the script in Arabic. Um, which I cannot read, so we need to get a translation of that. But that shows that um, that the the protest after George Floyd's murder were an international protest. So we want to show the U.S. in dialogue with the rest of the world, not just kind of standing on its own. That um, people were they were the um, hashtag say her name was really highlighting on trans women who have. Uh, trans women of color have experienced murder at an extraordinarily high rate. So we were really trying to be aware of the messages that people were saying, showing on the streets throughout 2020 and making sure that is reflected in our collection. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, we also were experimenting with other ways of uh, conveying historical interpretation because, as you might recall, in June 2020, our museum was closed. So with other colleagues, we commissioned a series of blog posts that initially focused on the question about anti-Black violence in the Midwest, but we're trying to convey to a, a wider range as possible the research of scholars about anti-Black violence, but hopefully giving, the, give, giving readers um, that really important context connect their present with the past. Uh, next slide, please. And um, one of the things that I have to emphasize when we're doing when we're doing the work, when I'm doing the work, I'll just speak for myself, of trying to reinterpret and to make connections, is the importance of research. Um, this probably stands to reason, but as um, anyone who works at a historic site or museum knows that there are um, many times that you feel like you have no time to read or think. And I have found that actually kind of using a crowbar to create spaces in my own calendar to read and to think as well as learn from others in conversation has been invaluable. So the book, Tech, uh, Dear Science by Catherine McKittrick is one that I've been reading with uh, several of my colleagues here and including Orlando, who you'll be hearing from next. And it's been expanding my ideas of not only what history and historical interpretation is, but how one reduces harm what citation practices means, how we share evidence and uh, with um, our audiences beyond only thinking about um, the uh, putting an object on display. And the National Youth Summit is a, an amazing program. Um, and I was uh, last, during the summer 2020, um, I was able to participate behind the scenes in learning about how how our museum com communicates with youth and youth educators. And I think kind of opening up that space um, through digital spaces, but also through, through platforms like this has been important and has infected how I've been thinking about interpreting African-American history at the museum. Um, next slide, please. And just finally, I, when we've talked about sharing with others, 
one of the ways in which I have been sharing with others has been um, create the, that um, recognizing that right now at the National Museum of American History, we are back at a, um, a commitment to interpreting African-American history. And we have a historic number of African-American curators in the 21st century. Um, many of you may be aware, even if you didn't know it, that you've encountered the work of, Af of Black curators who worked at American History, uh, Dr. Lonnie Bunch, Dr. Spencer Crew, Do Dr. James Horton, uh, and Faith Ruffins. And we are definitely standing on the, the six curators who are focusing on African-American history and who identify as Black are, folk, are pulling our efforts to continue that legacy and to you definitely work with the new strategic and interpretive plans to put an African-American perspective in the National Museum of American History um, after a time when that had um, essentially fallen in advance. Um, so I'm really proud to be part of this effort, and I feel that I'm working in collaboration with many of the people here on this at this conference, and uh, definitely with uh, Dr. Jeffries, who you heard of earl from earlier. So to continue this, I would just like to hand this over um, to my colleague, Dr. Serrano. Thanks, Madupe. Orlando, welcome up to the virtual podium. The host muted your your mic. Okay, we I'm I'm not the host, but I know the host, and I'm sure we can un unmute you. How about now? Yes, yeah, sir. All right. Um. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Well, first of all, my name is Orlando Serrano. And as I've been mentioned already, uh, yes, camera on would be great. I've got a few show and tell objects um, while we do the presentation. So if there's any way we have the presentation and me, not so you can see me, but you can see some stuff I'm gonna show you, uh, that would be great. If not, uh, I can just do show and tell at the end. So either way is fine. I am the manager of youth and teacher programs at the National Museum of American History. And as Anthea mentioned at the outset, I'm a former uh, classroom educator, classroom teacher. And quite frankly, it took a lot to prime me out of the classroom because I enjoy working with young people. I enjoy uh, sort of seeing what they can do um, and the <laughs> hope that is in their eyes and in their actions and their reading, even when they're being sort of snarky and mean, I appreciate it. Um, and the reason I, I decided to come to the museum is, you know, I remember during my interview process, uh, the person who's now my supervisor asked me, you know, so what do you, what is important to you in an education program? And I said, well, first of all, you know, I'm trained as a human geographer. So it's very important for me to do, you know, work wherever my feet are. And by work, I mean, trying to make the world a more just place. And I, we need to figure out a way to do that. Two, we need to take seriously the voices of young people and the possibilities uh, within their thinking and within their actions. And apparently that got a positive response because now I'm here. And I get to do both of those things uh, using and working with the collections that we hold and steward for, you all here who are with us today and the rest of the United States. Um, and I get to work with these amazing colleagues. And so for the next few minutes, I'm gonna share a little bit about some of the work that we're doing to reposition the kinds of program that we programming that we are doing both with and for young people and with and for teachers. And then towards the end, um, when the slides are over, uh, we can, I, I can share some some resources that I think are important and bear on my thinking, and perhaps they can be helpful for you all. Um, all right, so we have here a couple of slides of two new programs that have been born during uh, the time uh, of the pandemic. The first one on your upper left is a series of videos called Young People Shake Up Elections. 
And um, as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, it's very important for, for me that we take the work and the thinking uh, and actions of young people very seriously. And in these videos, what we wanted to do is have a conversation with five teens, bring them to a museum, show them some um, of our collections, give them some of the context behind some of these objects in the collections, and then have them have a conversation about it and ask us questions and have them really guide the conversation and the thinking about how previous young people in history have impacted their, the electoral process, policy at the local level, uh, even though they did not have access to the vote. And then after that, we tied those conversations to contemporary issues and models um, that we can see uh, to, to you know, have young people draw the connections. Uh, and here we have a couple of young people from Premier Girls in Action, which is a wonderful organization in Long Beach that works for the health and the well-being of the local Khmer population, folks impacted by the Khmer regime in, in Southern California. And then in addition to working with teenagers, we are really not shying away from having difficult conversations or providing resources for educators and parents to have conversations with uh, young people as early, uh, my camera's on now, thank you, Anthea, as early as pre-K through third grade. And we started a new, a new program called History Time in which we talk about what could potentially be challenging topics um, and we don't shy away from them. So I know one of the questions in the chat is what kind of pressures do we have as a quasi federal institution? Like we do, and we can talk about those earlier, but that doesn't mean we're going to move away from from telling the truths of this beautiful and tortured place we live in. And Mary McClude Bethune is one of the stories and actually Madupa helped guide the script in that um, iteration of the video. We also have talked about um, the importance of vaccinations and how vaccinations uh, came to be. And again, what, what I wanna stress about these resources in history time is that they are geared specifically for kindergarten to third graders. We've also talked about um, LGBTQ2, LGBTQ plus matters uh, through particular objects in our collections. This month, our history time episode focuses on the work of Dolores Huerta. So we are really, you know, thinking about ways uh, to provide resources for very young audiences that are steeped in anti-bias and anti-racist education. The next slide, please. Um, and in terms of shifting the kinds of conversations that we have with educators, we're also creating new stories and creating new programs that focus on what Oh, hold on, I have to get another book. What Trio would call, you know, silenced histories or hidden histories or buried histories, right? Um, and Viral Histories was a program that we came out with, um, produced last spring uh, when COVID was starting and really addressed anti-Asian racism and violence as it was ticking up. Um, and then the other slide that you see there is a new program that we have developed in partnership with the New York Historical Society uh, called In Conversation. And I, I do want to stress that this program is for teachers and works around their schedules so that they can get the um, education and continuing education creden credentials and needs that they need to maintain their licensing. Um, but what we're doing is telling different kinds of stories that maybe they haven't heard before. And so in that one, that episode, Unseen Labor and the Beauty Game, we told this, the story of Miss Silva, who is a woman of color who designed the beauty blender. And so um, we're able to talk about, you know, fashion and beauty history and the impact socially and culturally and historically of the entertainment industry, but through the prism of a woman of color. And we're doing several uh, programs that, again, shift the conversation just a little bit. And I saw in the chat, you know, that the ways that we're talking about oral history as Fatih presented, 
differ significantly from the WPA, you know, the next in conversation series that we have is on oral history. And um, Jose Centeno Melendez, who is our oral historian extraordinaire, is going to be our guest on that program. And, and having that conversation with him, with educators who oftentimes use oral history as a pedagogic strategy in their classrooms, will hopefully create the kinds of change that we are hoping to through our education and teacher professional development programming. Uh, next slide, please. And then the the last um, resource that I'll, I'll share is a website, a suite of resources that we developed in the last four or five years. That's not true, seven to eight years. I just worked on it for the last four to five years called Becoming Us. And this is a suite of resources that really puts immigration and migration at the center of US history. And it positions immigration and migration as not just a, you know, territorial border crossing issue, but movement within the United States and the movement of boundaries over space and time and the impact that it has had and they have had um, uh, on us as, as a as a country. And the way that we've organized this set of resources, um, next slide please, is that we have five units. Um, they they're all big themes uh, addressing all the content areas in, in social studies. And we'll get to them in a second, but then within each thematic unit, we have three case studies that touch down at historical moments in time and space and place. Um, one story is one that folks may be familiar with. Another is a story that may be less known to others. And, and then the third case study always is gonna be a tied to a contemporary issue. So on the next slide, you can see that the themes that we have are borderlands, education policy, belonging and resistance. And if we look at, uh, for example, resistance, right? Um, and, some folks may have heard of the Stoner Rebellion or Frank Free McCorder, um, or some people may have heard of different ways in which Native peoples, First Nations peoples have been and continue to resist. Um, maybe some people have heard of Amokali. Some people may not have heard of any of those. Um, we are really trying to leverage the connection that we have locally with DCPS, um, with school districts in Northern Virginia and Southern Maryland um, to have these kinds of conversations, these resources available for teachers to tell different kinds of stories that still get at the same content standards that they need to address in their classrooms, um, as well as our summer teacher training workshops to shift the kinds of stories that folks tell. So for example, and we can go to the, to the last slide or you can take me off the slides and I can share some, some resources. Um, this last summer, um, during our teacher workshop, we I partnered with a colleague over at the National Museum of African American Asian Culture, uh, Kendra Flanagan, and we gave a session on you know, teaching sensitive histories and we, you know being, the anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre, that is what we talked about and discussed. And it was it was surprising, I mean, I'm sorry, it was heartbreaking, but not surprising to hear and see in the chat that so many teachers, and we worked with over 250 teachers over two different weeks, that was each week. And to hear so many folks comment or say that they had never heard of Tulsa or why, why didn't I know about this? Um, again, heartbreaking, but not surprising given the way that um, education curriculum uh, ha has focused on particular kinds of stories and storytelling. And we're doing our best uh, to shift some of these narratives. And those are some examples of how we're doing it. Uh, and I thank you for listening. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Anthea. Great, thank you so much, Orlando and Modupe and Patti. Um, I am so appreciative and deeply honored and humbled to work with you uh, every day, and especially on a day like this, where I'm so grateful to your joining me. Uh, we wanted to end with something that is currently literally uh, downstairs. Um, this uh, 
exhibition uh, open on the 2nd of September with a, a, a very um, special uh, community um, in partnership with the Tallahatchie, Mississippi community and um, the Emmett Till family, uh, both um, especially from um, Chicago. Reckoning with Remembrance, History and Justice and the Murder of Emmett Till uh, is an exemplification really of the practices that you've just heard about, working in deep community, earning trust, um, the, the way in which um, an object can come to the Smithsonian completely rethinking uh, that along the lines of the restorative history practices that we've, we've touched upon. Um, this was uh, collected by uh, Madupe, uh, not Madupe, although you helped us uh, with the interpretation, this is collected by Sion Walt and Michael and Nancy Burka uh, in collaboration with the Emmett Till uh, Foundation. This is one of the, the markers that the uh, Emmett Till Memorial Commission um, worked for years to install. Again, very place-based understanding of how to interpret our layered and as I think you called it, beautiful and tortured landscape, um, Orlando. Um, this is the second sign that marked where um, young uh, Emmett's body was pulled out of the Tallahatchie River. Um, this one, the first one, of course, was was defaced immediately um, uh, 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 with gunshots. Um, this one has 317 um, bullet holes from made from a huge variety of ordnance. Um, and we take this opportunity to put it um, in. The, this is the center of the museum. Behind it is the Star Spangled Banner. There's only been one other object since 1964 that's been here, and there was a big Foucault's pendulum when the museum first opened, uh, of course, uh, nodding to our, our dual history and technology and science um, of groundedness when we first opened. Simple uh, four-sided uh, interpretation. Each of these words uh, was, was co-curated uh, with uh, community members. Um, you can see, um, all of our new uh, interpretive work is both in English and, and in Spanish for starters. Um, the, um, the kind of the surrounding embracing walls that we created to sustain it. Um, and then the day we opened um, the light from the, the, the skylights above um, kind of illuminating uh, the sign, uh, but two sided needs to be seen from both sides. Um, so you can both uh, understand the pain and the poignancy uh, the violence that was done to this sign, um, echoing the violence, of course, that was uh, that was done unto um, um, to Emmett's body himself, and the ongoing anti-black violence. Um, we wanted to end with this before we open it up for questions. We have about twenty minutes left, um, but I also wanted to to um, ask my colleagues if, um, especially uh, Patti, um, you were so deeply um, involved with this. Um, both with this exhibition, uh, with bringing the object, and now, of course, with the Center for Restorative History, if you wanted to share any reflections. Yeah, the, the, um, the one thing that struck strikes me so much about the, this object is that the community members didn't want it to come in the first place. Um, there, as mentioned, there was so much distrust. They, um, well, one of the one of the um, community members, Jesse James Dimming, she mentioned, "This is our history. This belongs here, right? This is this is the hard work that we created. It was through so much um, community organizing to to bring the site in and uh, to let it go to um, and bring it to Washington D.C. was just too much of a thought." And so that is a perfect example of what I mean of like the, the simple distrust. And for us, that is a call for us to work on that relationship. And as you know, the, the, the program culminated with um, her apologizing for distrusting us, but that, that is for me, um, the, the core point of the work that we're trying to do is to earn that, that trust and um, each of those steps of, you know, the co-curation, co the walking along the side of like, do you think this is, um, you know, we have choices of where to exhibit, where do you think will make the biggest impact? What, what are your needs besides um, showing this? Uh, 
um, marker in, in our museum, what else can we do? So those are the little steps that take along the way where it goes from distrust to absolutely um, a, a trustworthy relationship. Uh, so, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, maybe we could bring all of us up on, oh, look at us all up on screen. Thank you, thank you again to all three of you. Um, and uh, please, let's, uh, let's go to some questions. I'm happy and honored to moderate. We had one in the chat about um, debate around how to display lynching photographs. Um, obviously, displaying any type of um, of artifact, um, such as those photographs, which have their own incredibly complicated pedagogical and um, provenance-based uh, complications already before you even get to the horrific um, social and uh, community, um, political meanings. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, some people might be aware of the exhibit that was in the early, late 90s, early 2000s without sanctuary. Um, and I think I certainly have learned a lot from the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, historical Society site in Atlanta that did a great deal of community-based work on that. Mm -hmm. They reached out before they decided to exhibit it, but they thought extraordinarily carefully about the site in which it was placed. Um, these, this exhibit is um, probably 40 or 50 um, images of men and women and children who have been lynched, mainly Black people. And um, they reached out, they held, um, they were really leaders in reaching out to community groups and reaching out to people who may have had loved ones or family members who had been lynched. So they created a special space, one that you wouldn't just simply stumble upon, one that you would, where your intention of going to that exhibit would be um, that recognizing that you are, by deciding to go to that exhibit, you are um, making a choice to engage with, um, it's even hard to even articulate how horrific an under-documented lynching is. Um, and I have not gone to the um, Equal, uh, Equal Justice Initiatives uh, monument about um, lynching, but I'm sure people yeah. here who have um, yeah. could it's further on that. Yeah, thank you, Madupe. Um, I was I was going to bring up the Legacy Museum um, as as well as the interpretive site. It's um, the way in which, especially, um, and I think Joe, your work so beautifully echoes this, is bringing up working with community and literally bringing some of the soil from the lynching sites into a museum space. Um, combined with telling the long arc of enslavement uh, through Jim Crow, through mass incarceration, all in one kind of, you know, deeply, deeply powerful um, museum experience, I think is redefining the way in which, uh, at least in, in those types of ground up spaces, we can then tie into the temporality and the pain of the lived experience. And it's a reclamation project. It's highly restorative in that you are, literally bringing forth, um, sharing with the Equal Justice Initiative team and the Legacy Museum, um, the very place, some of the very place in which that, um, uh, that horrific uh, event took place, all lined up in the same size jars. And so the soil, of course, is richly different and complicatedly so, uh, and it's a, it's a remarkable power, remarkably powerful, um, uh, interpretation. So. Anyone who can get there, please do. I think it's it should be required public history viewing. Um, and of course, the pandemic has made so much of that travel and experience more difficult. But their online portal is also very uh, is very excellent as well. Let's see any more questions up in here. Uh, Quasi federal. We touched on that one a little bit. Um, learning from the Germans. Uh, so one of, um, hi, Leslie, I'm wondering if we've looked to Germany or any other countries, um, Germany, uh, South Africa, 
um, uh, certainly are kind of all uh, in our uh, in our kind of collective public history sites of, of, of dealing with that level of national horror and pain. Um, but um, anything um, anything else any one of my colleagues wants to add in terms of international examples? Uh, I will say say this. So, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to use my time for lots of things really quickly. Um, Good, whatever you want to do, sir. <laughs> Um, but to answer uh, your question most directly right now, Leslie, um, we are, so as an educator, right? Like I, I, that's one, that, that's one track in which I'm thinking about the question. Um, and it's very difficult when um, we refuse to actually talk about our past. Like that's, and, and, you know, again, that's not stopping us from developing the resources we, we, know are needed and are accurate. Like it's not even, <laughs> uh, one of my favorite uh, ways someone talked about our website when we had a panel was like, we didn't make this website because we wanted to be nice and include history. Like we made this website because it's true and it's accurate and to, to not be rigorous and accurate would not, would to be ahistorical, right? Um, and so that's one way that we're thinking about it. But then, you know, to go back to the Center for Reserve History for a moment, um, we are reading about, you know, specifically thinking about the kind of work we want to do that is driven by redress and working with historically harmed communities. Madupe and I just literally finished reading about transitional justice and how that has operated, you know, re regimes moving from, you know, really oppressive moments in time to more democratic moments in time like how do they do that and sort of alongside that what what are reparations what if it, what is restorative justice what is transition how do those all work together so they are in our orbit and we are thinking about them as we're developing the practices that Bati spoke about that um built off of what anthea presented at the beginning where we are trying to figure out ways to use history to again, address, you know, more redressive practices to change museum work um, by, by putting his, history and root cause analysis at the very forefront of it. Um, okay, so I wanted to show some books earlier. I didn't have a chance, so I will now. Um, this is this is what I do. Madupe is used to this by now. I'm sorry, Madupe, you've seen many of these already. But I, I, I need to second dear science, folks. Um, it, it is not an easy read, but it is uh, a, a challenge and a gauntlet for how we think about not not just history and analysis, but literally how to be alive in the world and what you know and and how the shift from paying attention to the fullness of humanity uh, instead of like categorizing, which Bati perfectly exemplified in 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 the way that she discussed the way that oral history is changing um, and how we're doing it, where we're not working off a prescribed set of questions, but like what what do we what happens when we listen to the folks who are in conversation with? How does that change the story? Um, how does it remove the questions? Um, how does it center the storyteller and not the interlocutor, which is quite frankly what a lot of historical analysis has been. Also, silencing the past. These are the two th theoretical groundings. But then to go back to you know, Modupe mentioned. Um, and, and Anthea mentioned as well, um, Minnie Jean Brown, like if, if folks have not read Push Out, um, I highly encourage you all to read this. And this is a new book for any teachers who may or may not be joining us, Black Lives Matters in School, which is a wonderful resource for um, the kinds of curriculum we want to develop. And then the last three, very place-based, because I said I'm a, I'm a, I'm a geographer. Um, Bati, when she was talking, reminded me of the Undocumented Americans, which, um, looks at the experiences across the United States of particular communities. And then Golden Gulag by Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, to understand the relationship that's between places across space, right? So oftentimes, you know, the work that you all are doing, um, which I, you know, from what I've been able to read, admire and, um, making the connections between the, our daily lives and the institutional structures above us um, or around us or through us. Um, Brucey gets at that. And because I miss him dearly, Clyde Woods, Development Arrested, um, 
which is also very place-based and, and focuses on the Mississippi Delta, I encourage you all to read this as well. All right, I'm done talking and publicizing books. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Oh, that was a, a great historiographical uh, whirlwind tour of, uh, of Orlando's favorites. Yeah. I think, yes. Yeah, if I may add um, one place we really look at for our own, uh, at least for the undocumented organizing collection initiative, were uh, museums or um, sorry, museums of memory, uh, largely in uh, Latin America. So museos de memoria. And these uh, come from places where, um, especially of state violence, uh, dictatorship, or um, censorship. And so these uh, were community-driven um, places where um, really you're, you're just uh, reporting people's testimony of what happened. And some may debate whether or not that's our history, but we really look at that as, um, for us, a, a great influence in how we conduct our work and really this like opening of of the, the danger and, and violence people face at it every day. Um, like. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for um, adding that one to our, to our list. Um, and it does all weave mm -hmm. into as well, the ways in which just confronting the, the, the kind of the narrative lockdown that we've, many of us have inherited. Um, and of course is very, very, very evident um, in the National Museum spaces that then our sister and brother museums, National um, Museum of American Indian, National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, have have taken uh, and really kind of helped dismantle that. But the work we're doing here, of course, is really trying to dismantle that with them, alongside them, but at the the flagship, if you will, to use the Arma kind of the Armada language. Um, uh, Mary, uh, Mary de la Fay, it's so great to see you. Um, Mary and I worked together at the National Trust a long time ago. We don't, as the speakers, we don't have access to the chat. And um, I think what we could do um, is send, uh, maybe to Laverta or to Joe, we'll send uh, that, um, that bibliography, those sources, happy to, happy to do that, and so that they can make them available. Um, but yeah, so as Madupe says, we can see the chat, we can see what you're saying, but we can't uh, go in and type with you. So uh, we'll do our best to, to moderate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we don't have access to the chat, but we will do our best to get uh, those, those books to you. Um, okay, other questions? From mm -hmm. our, can, and can, can the um, conference goers kind of unmute and ask questions or just in the chat? Or Joe, do you have any questions for us or anyone um, else who's joined? And Thea, I just wanted to highlight, there was a question that was in our private chat that was okay. to Patty and was asking mm -hmm. about Haitian immigrants and mm. um, with the undocumented work. Yes, I was about to answer, but okay. much better uh, for discussion. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are in a close uh, proximity and close collaboration with an organization called Indocu Black. So uh, based out of DC, but has a large wide network uh, throughout our nation. And um, obviously all hands on deck um, for the, the most recent news, but they really advocate for black migrants and black, um, they're one of the first uh, undocumented um, groups centering black lives and at those intersections. And unfortunately the, the crisis that we're seeing with Haiti is a direct pipeline of what we of the deportation pipeline that really began with the 80s and this mass of deportation of uh, Haiti um, Haitians back then and really set a precedent for what we see now with this uh, deportation pipeline. So um, while this feels new, as we all know, it is not, um, and it is very much grounded in our historical uh, roots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And if that's one of if that's one thing we can do to help the nation heal, to go, you know, and to hold it up to its uh, initial promises by revealing those perils and paradoxes, if you will, um, that I think that is certainly something we're, we're deeply committed to helping people understand. And that, again, that bringing history into utility and to lived experience mm -hmm. rather than into a learned experience or uh, kind of a fossilized mm -hmm. understanding 
Um, and Joe, your work in breaking through place in the kind of the fossilization that happens at many historic sites, um, you know, is, is, is an inspiration to us. And Joe just said, uh, um, oh, so you can only put things in the chat, got it. Uh, timeline for the new National Museum of the American Latino and the National the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. Um, they um, have, of course, just been authorized by Congress on the 27th of December, 2020, as if 2020 wasn't complicated enough. Uh, we have more complications in 2020. Um, just days after, of course, we had the uh, insurrection and the storming of the Capitol on the 6th of January. So it has, it has certainly made um, our work here even uh, kind of, uh, more complicated and more challenging. Uh, those have long arcs, Joe, that hopefully over the next 10 years, you'll see the museum um, as a physical manifestation. But for both of those, especially the the National Museum of the American Latino builds on the Smithsonian Latino mm -hmm. Center, our incredible partners there mm -hmm. who have funded much of our work and many of our staff um, over the years in the broader Latina and Latino um, uh, experiences, collections, programming, education, and exhibits. Uh, they'll open the Molina Family Gallery here next May uh, at the National Museum of American History, which um, we are very eager uh, and have been working with them um, to help uh, kind of shepherd and doula, if you will, that experience. And uh, we'll be opening with a, a major new show uh, called Presente, really kind of an overview mm -hmm. of Latino and Latina history in the United States. And then their next exhibition, uh, which we're deeply involved in, will focus on Latinx youth movements across time, across mostly the 20th century and into the 21st. Um, and then Laverta, Anthony, can you clarify where in the museum <coughs> the marker is located? It's in what we call uh, Laverta um, Flag Hall. When the museum was built, the Star Spangled Banner the, of the flag that um, flew at Fort Henry and that inspired the national the writing of the national anthem hung vertically behind it. About 2008 or so, it was fully restored and put in a special chamber behind, and then that kind of interpretive sculpture was hung on that space and then the Foucault's pendulum was removed um, and so that's just a big open hall in the museum so it's it's literally at the center of, of the museum um I just want to just follow on a little bit with something that Patty mentioned about the deport deportation of of that is going ongoing in the uh, on the border, and um, many of you probably saw on social media there were many historians and activists who were mobilizing history in a way that I just found incredible. Fascinating. Um, they were saying things like when there was a um, State Department person who said uh, who had just resigned because he said he would not um, tolerate people being um, refugees. Uh, asylum seekers, immigration seekers being put in Guantanamo. There were people explaining exactly why that was a, why Guantanamo isn't just this empty site where you can just, where Americans can put things. It goes to the US Spanish war. It goes to Spanish colonialism, but also um, the, the treatment of Haitian migrants. Haitian migrants were um, interred in Guantanamo um, in the 1990s um, and treated differently than potential Cuban migrants. So I was extraordinarily excited to see um, historians and activists kind of explaining with a lot of care to people who were asking innocent, like what they were saying, like, what's like, this is bad, but I don't understand the historical dimension. And from the work that you do, the um, the Haitian Revolution was a firestorm of the imagination mm -hmm. in um, mm -hmm. amongst enslaved people in the mm -hmm. in throughout the Americas and including North America. So the way in which Haiti is this like. Um, it's not a North Star, I'm mixing my me metaphors, but it has meant so much for actually understanding what yeah. liberation is. It goes yeah. right to the work that you're doing, which makes me really yep. like, this is why doing public yep. history is so extraordinary. Yeah. Oh, 
That's a beautiful statement uh, and a beautiful way to end. I think our time is up. I think we're supposed to end at noon. Am I right? Loverta, I think I'm right, sadly. Um, uh, please be in touch. Um, we're we're all very uh, we're all very uh, eager to continue the conversations. All of our protocols, our our email protocols, all are the same. So I'm Hartig A at si.edu, um, Labode M, Artiaga P, uh, Serrano O uh, at si.edu. And um, we would love to continue the conversation and we're deeply honored to be here. And I'm extremely grateful uh, for Pat Timabite in Orlando. So thank, thank you. you. I think we're good to go.